Hello, everyone, and welcome to our post-game edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Uh, I'm Dan Lobby, joined by Mary Kay Cabot. Uh, we are going to recap the Browns' 24-10 to win over the Washington Commanders. Uh, I'll talk to Mary Kay here for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll bring in Ashley Bastock and Ivy Harris. Uh, so, Mary Kay, let's get to it. I, I guess let's just do it this way. What's your biggest takeaway from this game today? You know, my biggest takeaway really is Deshaun Watson hanging in there uh, into the second half of this game, coming out strong in the second half and throwing three straight touchdown passes on those first three drives of the second half to blow open a 24-10 lead and, you know, to not get down when things did not go well in the first half of that game when he only threw for 23 yards, completed three of eight passes. It just wasn't going well offensively. He was getting sacked. Uh, The offensive line was overwhelmed by this excellent defensive line. And uh, they just weren't able to do anything in the first half, but they hung in there. And then he uh, checked off more boxes, made more progress with Amari Cooper, uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones, three touchdown passes, and they win the game. I I wrote after the game, one of the things that I think we have to remember is, first of all, Deshaun Watson's really good. That's not what I wrote. But football games are 60 minutes and good players usually figure these things out. And we we talked about it after the Jacksonville game a little bit. Like, had Deshaun gotten four quarters in that game, it probably would have just gotten progressively better. And I thought today, them coming out of the locker room and getting that passing game going like that, it was really important. It showed that, hey, you had a really bad half. It looked like we were going to be writing this team off and wondering if Kevin was the right guy for the job and all that. And then all of a sudden, you come out in the second half and just completely turn it around. It just speaks to how good I think Deshaun is and and how good this passing game can be. Yeah. And you know what else? I mean, this is, they've all said it, the best defensive line that they will face all season. Uh, So, you know, you've got those four first rounders. Now they lost one uh, in the middle of the game, but you had Chase Young back there. This was not an easy defense to, to score points on and to get, you know, to move the chains on at all. Uh, So to be able to come out and do that, I think it was tremendous. And I think really it is a glimpse of the future of what Amari Cooper and Deshaun Watson are going to be together. I think those two guys are going to be dynamite and we're going to be talking about them in the same way that, you know, people talk about Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs and the way people talked about Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill. And it's going to be a duo like that. Well, and that was the goal, right? When you went out and you got Amari Cooper. Now they didn't have Deshaun Watson yet. I'm sure they had an inkling they were going to go after Deshaun Watson, but there was certainly no guarantee at that point. But it was go and support whoever was at quarterback with a true number one receiver. And that's something that, you know, Odell never really developed into here. Um, it, maybe that had to do with the quarterback. I don't know. But bringing Amari in, it just brought, you know, he's a pro. He's, he's a great route runner. He just kind of does his job. And, and now you're seeing him paired with Watson, what he's capable of doing. Yeah, and to hear Amari talk about it, Uh, I think Browns fans should get really, really excited and encouraged about it because Amari each week seems happier and happier to me, right? He's bounced around the NFL a little (laughs) bit. You know, he was with the Raiders. Then he was with the Cowboys. He got traded from both of those teams. I feel like he's found a home here. And I feel like he's so excited to play with Deshaun Watson, not just because of how good he is as a, you know, as a regular quarterback, but the fact that you know, he's got somebody now that can make all these amazing off-schedule plays, and he's a dual-threat quarterback. And, you know, Amari has this incredible knack, almost an unparalleled ability uh, to get open as a route runner. And I think that that's just going to match up so well with those two uh, because teams aren't going to know how to defend those two guys once they really get their mojo down. And they're going to work together in the offseason. They both talked about that this week, that they want to work hard together in the offseason. Uh, we know they're going to do that. They're going to come back ready to roll. The only thing I have to say about this, Dan, though, is the fact that I think Amari is going to need off-season surgery on the core muscle injury that he has. I don't think you can really necessarily try to go into next season and battle through that thing again. It's hurting him. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he's not old, but he's – you know, he's approaching age 30. What is he, 28 now, I think. So you've got to get that stuff taken care of. And that does sort of get in the way of maybe them working together a little bit. But the offseason is long. I'm sure they'll be able to, to find some time for it. But, yeah, you want to be able to hit the ground running next year because, of course, they weren't able to do that this year. Uh, so you, you want to be able to do that. Donovan Peoples-Jones, by the way, I want to talk about 
Deshaun and, and DPJ. You know, we see them talking in the locker room all the time. And, you know, I think Donovan really appreciates that he'll drop a pass. And then on the very next play, that ball comes right back to him. And Deshaun kind of said, like, that's how he's going to operate. He's not going to lose faith in his guys. He believes in his guys. And I think that's big for a young receiver like Donovan Peoples-Jones to know that his quarterback, hey, you mess up on one play, that's okay. I'm going to come back to you on the next one, and you're going to score a touchdown. Yeah, and I mean, it really was the next one, right? I mean, it was the very next play after a drop that he came back to him again, and he got it that time. And you didn't hear me, but I predicted that that was going to (laughs) happen. I said out loud, Dan, he's going to come back and make and catch the touchdown pass on the next play. And um, and he did. And not only did he drop uh, the previous pass, but he also dropped the pass last week against yeah. the Saints. And had the one against the Bengals, too. Right. And But it doesn't stop Deshaun from coming back to him, showing faith in him. And as you mentioned, that will go a long way towards DPJ's confidence moving forward. These guys are still young. And, you know, it is going to take some time for everybody to get up to speed with Deshaun. So, uh, you know, good for Deshaun for doing that. So let's flip to the defensive side. This was sort of the Grant Delpit game I think we've all been waiting for, right? The We have a vacuum starting behind us. Uh, the Grant Delpit game we've all been waiting for as he came up with two interceptions. Um, they took advantage of Carson Wentz today. But that's what you're supposed to do as a defense. Like, if a quarterback's going to give you opportunities, you've got to take advantage of them. And to see Grant do that, and Denzel got one too, but specifically Grant, I thought that was big. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, Grant Delpit has been heating up for several weeks now, starting to make the plays that we thought he was going to make at the beginning of the season. He now has three interceptions in his last two games. The Browns have eight in their last five games. This is what the Browns thought that they were going to be getting from their defenders this season. It's a major reason why the defense hasn't lived up to expectations. They just weren't getting the takeaways. Now they're getting the takeaways, and you're starting to – Uh, get the front end working in concert with the back end. You're getting the pressure, you know, you're getting the errant throws and and you're getting the takeaways. And that's just going to mean so much next year uh, when this team comes together and starts to try to contend for the playoffs and win some games. The thing is, after that, though, you do have to capitalize on those. And they only got three points out out of three interceptions and one turnover on downs. Okay, so that's not anywhere near enough. Uh, so, but I do think that capitalizing on those things will uh, start to happen next year. Yeah, and you know we shouldn't just write off the first half because that that is when they got two of those turnovers and they were on a, they came away with like a field goal on one and punted on the, the other. You do need to be better. You can't have first halves like that, especially if you play better teams. And then next year you're hoping to play late into January. You can't come out and play a bad first half if you have to go to like Kansas City or Buffalo or, or someplace like that in, in a playoff game. Um, so we shouldn't just write it off, but I, it was really important that they turned it around and adjusted in the second half. Yeah, and you know, Deshaun is still learning his receivers. Kevin Stefanski is still learning Deshaun and the personnel. You know, it's not a well-oiled machine yet. I mean, this, is, this was his fifth start with the Cleveland Browns. That's why it's so important for them to have the offense intact right now. That's why they're not sitting down Nick Chubb or Amari or anything like that, because these are their you know tune-up games for what is going to happen in 2023. Josh Allen has had many, many reps with the offense that he's in and the guys that he's playing with. Same thing with Patrick Mahomes. Same thing with Joe Burrow. So the Browns have to fast track it. They have got to get this offense up to speed uh, so that they can – operate efficiently like these other offenses will be doing in November and December when it really matters. So we don't know, we're recording this at 7.30, so Baltimore and Pittsburgh have not kicked off yet. So we don't know what that game means next week. But I thought it was interesting. Deshaun Watson seems to be pretty excited about Pittsburgh week. And I, I'm actually excited to see him go against that defense and, and see what he can do uh, against that defense and TJ Watt, who has just been a thorn in the Brown side for years. I think this is going to be a very interesting finale, even if there's nothing left on the line for Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think so too. Obviously it will have a lot more meaning if the Browns can play the role of spoiler next week, like they basically did today uh, because now the Washington commanders really uh, have a very minuscule chance. I, think, I actually think I just saw their, I think the Green Bay win eliminates Oh, them. So, so I think okay. they're out. Okay, yeah. so the Browns played the role of spoilers today, 
and they might have the chance to do it again next week. Who would have thought when we looked at that game that <laughs> the Steelers would be the team gunning for the playoffs in that season finale? We would not have believed it if you would have told us uh, that in August. But, um, but yeah, I think these guys are really excited about that game. Uh, but one thing Deshaun is going to have to learn to do is somehow not take as many sacks. He, he can't do that. He took a lot of sacks in Houston, and he likes to – Uh, try to make a play and he likes to try to make something happen. Uh, But he's going to have to try not to take that many sacks because you go down the wrong way one time and you're going to get hurt. And with TJ Watt and Cam Hayward and those guys and the intensity of that rivalry, uh, they're going to have to get rid of the ball quickly. They're going to have to rely on Nick Chubb and that offensive line is going to have to be on point. Okay, Mary Kay, we're going to let you go here. Uh, We're going to take a break here on the Orange Brown Talk podcast. Ashley's going to join us. Irie is going to join us. Uh, And we will continue to recap the Browns' win over the Commanders here in Washington. NIL Now, a podcast dedicated to the name, image, and likeness of today's college and high school athletes. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future as a nest egg for something when something goes wrong. You know, there's less than 1% of these football players make it to the NFL. You know, their plan B is sometimes not as lofty as plan A. This NIL thing, when you when you ask what's the next important thing, is to make sure that these players are coming to school for education, sports, but also NIL is a close third in that. It's an investment into these players now that they can take advantage of or leverage their name, image, and likeness to you know, further their careers. So now you have a nest egg after you've invested so much time into your skill set in college. You should be able to leave college with something. This is NIL Now. Welcome back to the Orange and Brown Talk podcast, recapping the Browns' 24-10 to win over the Washington Commanders. As promised, Ashley Bastock is here now. Irie Harris is here. And we're going to continue to do takeaways uh, even if they're similar to what Mary Kay and I just talked about, I want to hear your guys' thoughts. I'm, I'm curious what you took away from this game. So, Ashley, what did you take away from this thing? <laughs> well, uh, number one, I think most importantly, is that the passing game is starting to come together. And obviously, I'm going to assume that you guys talked about Amari Cooper already. But one of the things I wanted to talk about that I thought was really interesting was when Deshaun Watson got asked after the game, like, what was your best throw? And he said, you know, those Amari plays were awesome. But Amari did a lot of the work on them, right? He had a lot of yards after the catch. His best throw, he thought, was to Donovan Peoples-Jones for a 13-yard touchdown. And I truly cannot keep talking about this enough. Like, I think those two have developed such a good connection. And Deshaun basically said, like, they're in the red zone. He knows he has to make a play. And he knew before the play started that he was going to 11. That's what the, was paraphrasing his quote here. Um, but I think, like you're kind of seeing these moving pieces come together. And I do think it's really important that he feels a connection with both of those guys, but because of how well Amari played today, you know, on limited targets, like I think it's really important that Donovan still kind of got going in his own way and was almost like a safety valve for Deshaun in a red zone situation. I think that that's huge that he's got that chemistry already. Yeah. So, so we did touch a little bit on the DPJ thing. And I re, I think what I really like is Deshaun saying that, even though DPJ had that drop right before, he was going to go back to him. And we've seen him do that a number of times with Donovan. And, you know, if Donovan didn't haul in the one against, you know, last week he didn't haul in the fade against Cincinnati. But Deshaun's not giving up on this guy. And and that connection, you know, it finally paid dividends today. Oh, definitely. I think that we've noticed this even early on, too, even going back to, uh, I'd like to say Deshaun's first actual game when, you know, some of the rest was coming off and, you know, 276 versus Cincinnati and when he kept on going back and back again to DPJ, they's really become definitely a comfortable weapon for him when there were when the defense is worried about your four time pro bowler and Murray Cooper and even in the sense of tight end, you know, position with David and Joku, DBJ is right there within that range of somebody who's still getting their feet wet, but somebody that I know I can trust because he's putting the work and the chemistry is just going to blossom from there to where he becomes that X factor for Watson. So Ashley, well, you know what? No, I'm not gonna bring him up because it maybe maybe Irie will. <laughs> Irie, what was your takeaway? Oh, man. Well, my 
my true takeaway was that Washington is not trying to make the playoffs with, with the changing of the quarterback. Uh, but keeping it Browns perspective wise, my takeaway just you know off top was there's still a, a bit of limit within carries uh, for Nick Chubb. I know that something that was spoken about quite a bit was the rushing title and how he was sitting in, in, uh, in third place. Derrick Henry, who said who was sitting in second, you know, missed. Uh, you know, Sunday's game when Tennessee lost to Dallas, and it was only Josh Jacobs who has below 100 yards, I think, right now within the Raiders game today. Uh, so, but then when it comes to Chubb going against Washington, you know, look, you're already out of the playoffs. As much as we spoke about Deshaun, you know, just slinging in and being able to get it going, should have been a sense for <clears throat> regarding Chubb to be able to make up for some of the past bad games that he's had throughout this season because he's really shown. Yeah, he's still within that conversation of being amongst the best. The fact that that ugly first half in which they still tried to establish, you know, the pass game, and Chubb is still getting 62 rushing yards after four attempts in the in the first quarter alone. The second quarter is another thing because Washington had the ball for most of that quarter. But the fact that they just never think to just fully pound, you know, the ball and run it through, run it down their throat is something that I take away in that they're still, even in the midst of a quarterback being rusty, in a, a very ugly first half, multiple times an interception is nearly caught, still not looking to run the ball as much as they should. Ashley, it felt like Nick Chubb could have rushed for 250 yards in this game if he wanted to. I do want to bring up, though, the Browns' drive that ended in the Peoples-Jones touchdown um, started at their own 16, and it went Chubb for nine, Chubb for seven, Chubb for six, Jerome Ford for nine, and then they had an, an issue with an, an ineligible downfield. But they kind that drive to me felt really – so this was the one that started at 656 in the third quarter. That drive to me felt like, okay, they're, they're figuring a little bit of this out. Now, they did kind of go pass heavy after that. Chubb, Chubb had a one-yard run later in the drive. But kind of starting off with establishing, establishing Nick Chubb on the ground – and then really attacking through the air that, that felt like a really um, it just felt like that drive made a lot of sense. You, you can kind of sense what they were trying to do. Yeah. Like it really feels to me like that is probably the formula they kind of need to follow for this offense. Right. Because I think for it to be as effective as everyone wants it to be with the individual pieces that they have, you have to have both of those things going so that you're essentially a pick your poison style of offense. Like you, you either bait the defense into selling out to try to stop Nick Chubb. Um, and if they do that, you have Deshaun Watson get going in your pass game or Deshaun Watson, you know, making a split second decision to keep the ball and run. Of course, we know how good he is with the RPO stuff, but I do think you have to have, a mixture of it. But part of me at the same time, like I know Cleveland fans are always clamoring for more Nick Chubb. There is like a small part of me, like, yes, you have to figure out how this works, but we're at the point in the season where you don't want to run Nick Chubb into the ground. And and Nick Chubb is very durable, right? But it, it just worries me given that there's nothing at stake right now. Like I'm okay with him not getting 20 carries. I'm, I'm normally okay with that because I understand what they're trying to do with, with, you know, as far as preserving him. Um, but I just, Maybe everyone calm down a little bit. Like uh, th- these games are meaningless for the Browns right now, other than seeing what they have next year. I do think a drive like that is really important. But you know, if we get a little less Nick Chubb next week, I'm I'm honestly okay with it. You don't have to put him in bubble wrap, but maybe a little less than a meaningless week eighteen. Yeah, week eighteen game. Yeah, you know what I'm hearing, Irie is Ashley saying that you just uh, you don't care about Nick Chubb's well being. I understand of uh, Nick Chubb, you know. Maybe expect maybe he's waiting a little bit too much, but you know what? Two things I will say. For one, I'm fine with them setting out the next week. But if he sets out, set Watson out, set the whole, set Cooper there. Let them laugh and talk amongst this terrible season on the sideline next week in Pittsburgh. But I think the other part is because there's been multiple games, multiple times where even going into even with the first half today, which I was going to say, there's still a lack of adjustment to the game at hand. And, and it seems like as if Stefanski and Van Pill still wanting to attack at whatever they had scripted early on is the reason for people probably clamoring about more and more runs from Chubb. Because this is nothing new from what he did today. He's done this before where he's limited in carries, maybe just getting over double digits, and he's still eclipsing 100 rushing yards. So 
at this point, it's making up for what was not seen and done early on in the season when it had to be done. And hopefully just saying, hey, if we're not going to make the playoffs, let's just see, at least see our running back, you know, win the rushing title, a, you know, a title that he's finished second in uh, the last two of the three seasons, you know, prior to now. So I think that's probably what all the claim is about. It, it was a little disconcerting in that first half when the passing game was just brutal and the highlight of the first half was a pass to Jack Conklin. Um, that it was a little rough to to make the case that you shouldn't just hand the ball to, to Nick Chubb a little more often. It was, I mean, in that first half, I'm wondering, are we going to be like, legitimately, I was wondering, are we going to be questioning Kevin Stefanski after like, should he even be the coach anymore? That that's how bad that first half was. And I think it's very telling. I thought it was really encouraging Irie, how they were able to turn it around in the second half. It, it, you know what, Dan? It definitely is. But I, I still, and I give props to the offense. Like I give props to the passing game. You know, I give props to Watson still going on trying as they did. But honestly, within the small sense of it, I kind of see it in a sense as like that's that stroke of luck. You know, Washington is not the best best defense in the league. They're right within their middle range. Within, I believe they're like 13th or something like 15th coming into this, uh, today with them fewest passing yards uh, allowed. So then, but just when you combine that with how we've seen Watson so far, I mean, we still haven't really, I would say, seen any wow moments as we have expected when it comes to Watson. Uh, there's been multiple questions. I'm sure there's Brown fans right now still questioning how Stefanski is still going to hold his job uh, going into the next season. But it is encouraging to see the passing him coming on the bit. But there has to be that sense of balance and really more so adjustments. I think that's really what I'm getting at is the adjustments that have to be intact. No, nobody's arguing with 30 pass r- passes and 30 rushes. But you're not going to adjust to what's at game when something's not working. And shift off, shift your focus to another part of the offense. Because if you don't, it's just going to be like it, it was today. Okay, Ashley, let's spend a little time on the defensive performance. Um, we, again, Mary Can, I touched on it a little, but this was, you know, Jadavion Clowney after the game, I asked him, like, did you guys know you were going to get some opportunities today? And he just said, yeah, we, we all watch film. So <laughs> Jadavian can't help himself. But look, Carson Wentz gave them opportunities, and they took advantage of those opportunities. And once again, here we are, like, God, if you could have just done this in September and October, where would this football team be right now? If they could have just taken advantage of some opportunities that were that were given to them. And today, we keep seeing these glimpses. I mean, this had to be Grant Delpit's best game, right? I mean, yeah. I heard his name, like, all game long. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm working on some takeaways now, and Grant is one of the takeaways. You know, it's been quite, I think, the turnaround for him this year because, you know, it seemed like early on in those early losses, especially the Jets game, like, Grant was always around these big plays happening for other teams, and either he was the one directly responsible for the mistake or, you know, he's becoming the scapegoat on Twitter, whatever. Um, and I think today, and, I mean, going back to last week, he's now had three interceptions in the last two games. I think you see, like, how big he is. He's 6'3", so, like, he's built a lot differently than, like, JJ3, right? You see how he can use his frame to kind of cover a lot of ground. And I think you're seeing him hopefully, you know, for the Browns, come into his own a little bit. Because obviously last year was really his first year playing at the Achilles injury, his rookie year. So this is really only like his second year since he had that redshirt year mixed in. But I thought he was definitely a highlight. You know, I thought Jadavian on that Miles sack that was that was all Miles. Um, I thought he made a nice like hustle play on that too. And and you saw it, you know, the camera angle on the broadcast, like from behind Carson Wentz, where you see those two guys just closing in. And I'm like, I would love to know what was going through Carson Wentz's head at that situation. When you see Jadavian Clowney on your right and Miles Garrett on your left, just charging at you. Cause they, they definitely were, I think, taking advantage of, of those opportunities and a, going against Carson Wentz today. They they took advantage of what he gave them. So I read Miles Garrett um, today, finally, they, they played him in some different spots. But what I really loved on one of those sacks is he was standing up, he was over the center, and he just, like, dominated. Like, he looked like this dominant force in the middle. I feel like some of that stuff has been lacking, and – 
I don't know. It's probably too late for Joe Woods. Again, this is one of those things where it's like, why didn't you do this earlier? But I loved seeing them try something different like that with Miles, playing standing up right in the middle of the line. Yeah, well, this, this is what we speak about when we speak about adjustments. Not just within offensively, but even for the defense. We see how Garrett has been throughout the season, even when recovering from the car accident, you know, the car wreck that he had. And, but putting him in different spots within the defensive line can cause chaos alone for, for the opposing offensive line because they're coming and watching film prepared with another game plan. They were not prepared to find Garrett in this spot compared to him being usually on the end. So I, I definitely I remember that sack too that you're speaking about. And when I saw that I just thought the same thing of why was why wasn't this done prior early on in the season where you're just switching things up a bit, just changing it up instead of it keeping the same stable game plan and hoping that it just works. Because then that point, by that point, that's just insanity of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And that's why it was a, it's on the hot seat and, and it's 50-50 if it comes back or not. Okay, before we go here, um, I want to ask you guys, because I, I felt like Deshaun, I mentioned this to Mary Kay, we talked about it in our video, um, I mentioned it in the first part of the pod. I felt like Deshaun was a little bit excited to go against Pittsburgh. And again, I'll just throw the disclaimer out there. We're recording this before Baltimore and Pittsburgh have even kicked off. We don't know if this game's going to mean anything to, to the Steelers next week. But, Ashley, what are you watching? Like, how important is this game? Kind of this first this first time taking Deshaun Watson to, what's it called? Is it Ac- Acrisure Stadium? Yeah. And Whatever. You, I think I think so. And do you know why? Because that's where I'm seeing, seeing Taylor Swift. So that's where my tickets are for. That's how I go. remember the name now. Um, anyways... I I do think, like, it's kind of important, right? Like, the Browns, I described this game today as, like, kind of a meaningless game for the Browns. And it is a meaningless game. Like, they're not going to make the playoffs. But, like, boy, would it have been way worse if they lost this meaningless game. I think it's always good to get a win against the Steelers because they are, like, a division rival. And I think they're always, they always somehow end up having a better record or, like, contending for the playoffs, even when we think they're bad. Like this was the same thing last year. We thought they were so bad. And then they ended up sneaking into a wild card spot. Um, and they ended up killing the Browns on Monday night football in a like horrible game that again, prompted Dan to say, maybe Baker Mayfield is not going to be the quarterback again. And he was right. Um, so I do think it's important, like in that regard. Right. And we, we can already probably guess like Deshaun Watson's not going to get a very warm welcome there, um, obviously, because of everything that surrounds him. And and I think it is going to be another test because that's probably going to be like that for the rest of his career when these two teams play in Pittsburgh. Um, So I I do think it's important. And at the very least, like these guys, and you heard it from Deshaun, you heard it from Miles, I thought too, like they want to play spoiler. So even though they don't have anything to play for, like, I think they've kind of invented something to play for, so to speak, a little bit. Um, and whatever stakes they, they need to have to be able to get up on, on, I don't know, maybe Sunday. We were waiting on the game time for that game. For that game, um, I, I think you kind of need to adopt that as a team. And I do think it matters if only because it's the Steelers and it's an opponent you see time and time again every single season. I read Pittsburgh is – that stadium is so annoying. They play this – They play this whistle or like horn thing on third downs. They do this, this renegade video in the fourth quarter. It is like just this relentless, like, I don't know. There's just something about that stadium. I, I, it's, it's just this relentless annoyance, but it's also been like a a house of horrors for the Browns, especially at the end of a season. So for you, I, I guess, what do you want to see in, in that final game against the Steelers, regardless of what it means for them? <laughs> Re- it, it emphasis on regardless of what it means, because we don't know what this game means anymore. Uh, I would like to see them go out and play for the pride of the Browns. I'm not saying for themselves, but for the Browns. That may sound like a total Stefanski answer, but let me clarify. I mean that in the context within the rivalry between the Browns and the Steelers. When you go back to that Thursday night game during, in week three when the Steelers visited Cleveland, that was an instant classic. Not knowing where these two teams would end up at 
record rise or position wise throughout the end of the season, but you can just feel that energy, feel that atmosphere. And it's gonna be a quadruple that, like you said, with Watson in there. But I just wanna see more of a free flowing just freedom within the players being out being able to go out there and play and if anything, mess up any playoff chances for the Steelers or leave it along with that, give Mike Tomlin his first losing season of his career. There's gotta be something to to play you know, about when it comes to these rivals, especially the Steelers. So that's what I would like like to see. All right. Uh, there we go. Our orange and Brown talk post game show, the Browns 24 to 10 winners over the Washington commanders. Uh, you heard Mary Kay earlier. That was Ashley and Irie. Make sure you're subscribed to this podcast on Apple podcast, Spotify, and YouTube. Just search Cleveland Browns on cleveland.com on YouTube to find our channel to get subscribed to that. And also become a football insider subscriber, cleveland.com slash Browns blue banner at the top of the page. We will talk to all of you later.